You know the first song, Your Grace is Enough. And I think for me, that's the assurance that I rest in. I've blown it enough. You, you know, the, the one sheep that wanders off the story that Jesus tells, and Reckless Love has a line in there about the one. You know, not only does that sheep have a, a spirit of risk, willing to get out and, and go. And, and I've been that sheep enough to know that, you know, sometimes, sometimes getting out is exciting. Right? There's a level of excitement about something new and, and different and independent. But at some point, If it's not in God's will, you get to the place where you start to feel lost. And you start to feel like, like there might be something wrong. And the anxiety builds and the depression builds and, and the worry builds and, and maybe the anger builds. Maybe you're mad at yourself because you did it again. And then you realize that you're lost. And there's no going back. But God's grace is always enough. And he comes and he finds you and finds me and finds the one and, and brings us back with a reckless love. I love, I love when songwriters and pastors um, use words like risk, or reckless, or abandoned. Because whenever, whenever we're talking about God, there's a level of assurance. You can offer God's reckless love to someone who has hurt you, to someone who has wronged you, to someone who has done it over and over and over. That doesn't mean that you put yourself in an abusive situation, but it means that you can offer forgiveness and love because you've experienced as a Christian God's grace being enough and he calls us to that love and grace for those around us recklessly with risk and assurance. Many of you have, if you've been around me, you've heard um, me talk about prayer and how God always answers our prayers. Always. And he never answers them with a no. You pray for something and it's either yes, it's not yet, Or, I have something even better for you. It's never a no. His love is reckless. And, and if you're willing to take the risk, you know, Israel, when they went into the wilderness, um, when they were freed from the bondage of slavery, God led them in the daytime with a pillar of smoke and at night a pillar of fire. And how great would it be if we could just see that and move in that direction? Right? Right? Wouldn't that be great? If you just knew. If 
you can see it. If, 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 you, if you end up with your, with your back up against the sea and nowhere to go and the enemy coming and God just parts the sea and you walk through, wouldn't that be great? How, how much would you trust God? And how much would you love God if, if God was parting seas for you, if God was guiding you with visual cues, wouldn't it be great? I, I, I sit back and, and think about that, that story, and I'm like, yeah, that's what I want. That's what I need. If I, I, could, I, I would take that risk. I would take that risk. I would do that for you, God. If you only, if you only, if you only... Hey Eric, you, would you play? Come on, come up, come on up here and play a little bit. We're gonna. We're gonna you you know the, the the backwards falling trust game, right? That they do at like corporate retreats, right? I, I know it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so it's a little more risky because we gotta stay six feet apart. And 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 are are you six feet tall? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Then I might be able to grab you by the hair on your way down. But if. Well, I can go. Do you, you know this game, right? So, so he, Eric's going to come take another step forward, turn around, right? And, and, and now I don't want you to do this, but just pretend. We're just playing. So, so in this situation, right, you have somebody behind you, and it's a trust thing, right? Eric would take the risk of falling back, and I would catch him, right? And, and it's supposed to build trust. But, but the game gets really interesting if, if I come down here, and now, don't, you don't have to look at me, don't you? Hey, for, when he, I don't know if you know, when he, when he was coming up here, when I was talking, and he was like putting it all together, he's like, okay, he didn't prep me for this, and, um, and he's going to catch me, and he's eyeing me up, and he's like, I don't know if I trust, is he strong enough? He's an old man. How's he going to, you know, like, what's going on? He, he was eyeing me up. And if you could, if you, if you, you if, if he didn't have a mask on, you'd see the worry in his face when he came up here. He, but, but it gets really interesting if, if I'm down here and, 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 and now he has to trust that I'm going to catch him. Do you think I could catch him? Yeah. That's a lot of faith. What about now? Now, is, is that stupid of him to fall backwards? Or, or what, what if I was God? Go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, for, thanks for being my prop. What if, what if God is asking you to take a risk and trust him? And, and, and you can't see him. You don't know if, he, if, if he's right here or if he's like out in space somewhere. Are you, are you going to take the risk? And, and, and I'm not talking about if your neighbor tells you to take a risk. I'm talking about if in your heart God is calling you in 2021 to take a risk. Because if he's calling you, then you can have assurance that it's going to happen. You know, we just got... Christmas was an amazing time. I, you know, for those of you who are with us um, online or in person at Switlick, it was fantastic. It was an amazing Christmas celebration. At least I thought it was. Um, but the Christmas story that we just got through, you know, you had, you had a whole bunch of people, a whole country, praying for a Messiah. And you had prophets who were prophesying about the Messiah who was coming to save Israel and the world. And they were like, 
prophesying 700, 600, 500, 400 years before Jesus was born. So I'm, I'm, I'm weaving a story for you from Scripture to get you to the place to realize that today is the beginning, not today, but it's the third day of a new year. And New Year's are great because they, they call us to, to kind of evaluate where we are in the present and where we've been in the past and where we're going in the future. It's like, a, it's like the goal setting, right? Last year, I had a goal to lose weight. Do you like the new slender me? <laughs> Here's the thing. The story of the Exodus, the Israelites, the people of God, who were saved from the bondage of slavery, went out into the wilderness and experienced incredible miracles. They experienced, they experienced the parting of the Red Sea. They followed clouds and pillars, pillars of clouds and fire. They saw rock give forth water. One event after another. And you know the story, right? The people of Israel who were freed from the bondage of slavery never got into the promised land because they didn't have faith enough they didn't rest in God's assurance. They went out into the wilderness following Moses. And, and God led them. If you ever see the map, the map is crazy, right? Where, they, where, where we think they went following the pillar of, right? They were following God. And God knew exactly what he was doing. But the promised land wasn't for them. It was for their children and generation after generation. When God was prophesying through the prophets seven, six, five hundred years, four hundred years before Jesus came on the scene, he was letting them know that the time was coming. They were praying for this, this, the Messiah, the Savior, who would save God's people, but, but they didn't know why God wasn't answering. Where was the Messiah? Where was the Savior of the world that God is telling Isaiah and Jeremiah and Malachi and Habakkuk? Where, where, where is this Savior? And God's answer to their prayers wasn't no, it, and, and it wasn't even not yet. It was a not yet, but you don't even know how big and, and amazing this is going to be. Um, January 6th, uh, do you know what January 6th is? Epiphany. Epiphany, um, we, we um, in our family, we get like a king cake. You might know the king cake from Mardi Gras or um, Fat Tuesday, but, um, but the king cake we do also uh, is epiphany, right? So it's this uh, pastry looking round circle with all like festive fruits on the top. And um, there's baby Jesus is somewhere inside. And you cut it up and everybody gets a piece and whoever gets the baby Jesus is like, uh, depending on the tradition, either king for the day or, um, or they have to buy the cake for next year or whatever. There, there's all kinds of different traditions. But, um, but the, the, uh, the, the magi, 
left their home and took a risk following a star. They saw the, the, the Christ star in the sky. There's a lot of speculation about what that is. Um, I think on December 21st, the Christmas star was up, right? Um, I don't know much about it. I didn't, I didn't, I just know it was there. I didn't research that. But, um, but there's a lot of speculation about what the star was in the sky at the time when the, the wise men, um, the Magi, left and, fo- and followed it. And um, the question that a lot of scholars ask about the star is, is, is uh, twofold. One is, well, how come the people of Israel didn't recognize the star in the sky? How come they didn't see the signs in their own prophecies about the Savior being born? Where were they? Why weren't they looking? What was going on in that situation where they couldn't even tell that Jesus was born? The, the second thing is, how, what, what was the star in and of itself? Was it like, was it a, a, a comet or was it Jupiter? Or was it the alignment of Jupiter and Saturn in a fish shape? Like, there's all kinds of theories about it. Here, here's what, the one that I, that I kind of subscribe to, uh, John MacArthur, a pastor out in California, he talks about it this way. He says that um, if you remember back in, in Exodus, the Shekinah glory of God, came. And Moses, it was so bright, it would have consumed Moses, but God hid him behind a rock and came. And then just, he got to see the tail end of the Shekinah glory and it made him glow. It was like the ultimate tan. And he covered it up so, so, so that, you know, uh, so that it, it would stay around and people, you know, like, it, and, and um, if you remember the story of the shepherds in the field the day that Jesus was born, what happened? An angel of the Lord came and told them. And then the glory of God, the Shekinah glory, shone all around them. And it lit up the sky in such a way that these people from the east that heard stories about this Messiah that was to be born Savior to the world, not just to Israel, but even a bigger vision than what Israel thought. And they left everything and took a risk and followed what they saw. What's God calling you to take a risk? Is it to let go of something? Is it to let go of the the bondage that might be holding you back? Is it to let go of an addiction? Is it to let go of of a relationship that's toxic? Is it to let go of a job? Is it to let go of, of your pride? Is it to let go of your your finances? Be more generous. Is it to let go of what is it? What 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 is the risk for for the Israelites that were in Egypt in slavery? It was the risk of freedom. It was the risk of letting go of the bondage. It was the risk of letting go of people telling you what to do, how to do it, and where to do it, and be, and 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 following your own path, God's path for you. It was letting go of of the gods around them for the God who assures them. For all the prophets, it was, it was speaking up for God, not knowing what the outcome was going to be. They had to be willing to let go of their family and their pride and their social status and everything to take the steps that God was telling them to take because he was telling them to prophesy about something that, that, that they weren't even going to witness in their lifetime.
What's God asking you to risk to let go? Or maybe it's what God is asking you to risk to do. Is it to to get serious about your spiritual disciplines or to get serious about prayer? Is it to give more than you think you can give? Is it to to love more than you think someone deserves to be loved? Is it to forgive? Or to accept forgiveness? Um, my, My wife, Denise, is here with me this morning. Pastor Denise, she has the day off, so she's here. And um, we've, years ago, we we decided that we would do foster children. And we have four kids of our own. And, um, and, you know, um, you can hold your judgment now, but I know that we're not perfect parents. So um, they get a little wiry and squirrely sometimes, but, uh, but they're great kids. And I'm proud of them. Uh, but we decided we would open our home to other children, not knowing what that risk would do to our family or to our kids. And it, it has become one of the most wonderful experiences that we've had. And we, we've seen our hearts expand from our four children to having love for these other kids that we had the opportunity to help and to help their parents. What's God asking you? You see, when, when, when Eric was here and I was back there, it would, it would have been foolish for him to fall. He would, have land, he would have bounced three times before I got to him. One of the things that I enjoy, for better or worse, are uh, superhero movies. And I like DC better than Marvel, so, you know. But watching the new modern Superman movies, I think uh, at some level gives us uh, a perspective of, of what it really means to be miraculous or incredible or, you know, because Superman moves so fast that if, that if Superman was there, you could have total faith. You could fall. He could get you before you got that far. God is bigger than Superman. Superman is fiction. God is real. And if God is asking you to fall, to take a step of faith, to move in a certain direction, to let go of pain that has been causing you bondage, to to let go of of finances, to let go of, 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 uh, of, of a closed circuit family for extra foster kids, to let, to let go of what you think you have control over and you need to keep in check. If God is calling you, you can have the ultimate assurance that even though it might be difficult, even though the path might be not be direct or the way that you think it should be, God will guide you and God will bring glory out of it in amazing, amazing ways. The scripture for this week that I want to read to you is just like an exclamation point on the glory of God. I love the book of Ephesians Paul writes this short six-chapter letter to the church in Ephesus, and it is so powerful and so rich. You could could do years of study just on that. 
and, it, and, and it's amazing. But he opens it up, and he opens it up to this church. And what he wants to share with them is the assurance of God's power in the face of whatever adversity comes their way. He's telling this fledgling church that believes in this guy that they heard about, never met to be the Messiah of the world, the Savior of the world, the one who brought life out of death, the one who can forgive your sins. And he did it on a Roman cross. And they were in a culture where they knew what that meant more than we could possibly ever even imagine. They knew that committing their lives to Jesus Christ meant that they were going to be outcasts and excluded if people found out. Paul says to them, he, he starts with a simple greeting and then he, he says these words. And as we sit here today in 2021, after the year we had, And the year's starting off with high death rates and COVID numbers and schools and cra it's, it's a crazy time. But I know that God is working powerfully like a refiner's fire. And if you're out there lost, God will bring you home. He will find you. And if you're here as a Christian today with your life committed, maybe it's time to recommit or maybe, maybe you're like, well, well, what's the risk? What's the risk that God is calling you to take? What's the risk that God is asking us as a congregation to take? This year, we're going to have to be risky as a church. We're going to have to take risks like never before. But they're going to be risks that God's calling us to. And the glory that's going to come out of it is not for you and for me. It's not for our town. It's not for the Methodist church. The glory that will come out of our risk-taking is for God's glory in this world. And it might not be for the saving of this generation, but it might be for the saving of the next. Who knows? Unless we take the risk. Here's what Paul says. He says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. He has blessed us not just here, but in all of the heavenly realms through Jesus Christ with every spiritual blessing. For he has chose us, you and me, in him before the creation of the world even, to be holy and blameless in his sight. See, the, 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 what he does there is he, he marries that grace that is enough with the truth of holiness and righteousness. You see, he's calling us to truth but he offers us grace to get us there, right? So when you're, when you're talking to someone who doesn't know Christ or, or doesn't, uh, it doesn't get it, God's abounding grace, you, you, be, you can be forgiven. You can make it better. God, God can come to you and can change you and transform you and move you. And, and God can, God can, God can. And he will. And he'll, he'll leave the 99 to come after you. He'll, he will rescue you and bring you home and have a celebration. The prodigal son can come home. The prodigal daughter can come home. But, but, If you really want to see the glory of God manifest, his grace is enough. Once you're saved, you're, you're saved. 
But the truth, the truth, the truth will set you free. And he says, he says in that verse, he chose us in him, not by anything we've done, but by what Jesus has done for us. The grace of God, he has chosen us before even the creation of this world to be holy and blameless in his sight. So Christ makes us holy and blameless. In love, he's predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to be to, to the praise of his glory, glorious grace, which he has freely given to us in the one he loves. Blameless in his sight, free to you and me. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of his grace that he lavishes on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us <clears throat> the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be to, to, put, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Each of us, in our own way, and, and as a group, as a church, <clears throat> whether you're here in Jackson or halfway around the world watching this and claiming us as, as your church, as the body of Christ that you're connected to. Each of us is fulfilling that plan by taking risks for God day by day. Each of us is growing. And each of us fails. And the grace of God comes in, picks us up, dusts us off. And hopefully, right, inserts, God does, inserts wisdom. Hopefully we hear it. And we grow. We grow stronger. We go, grow more gracious. We grow more loving. We grow more like Christ. Because through us, here on earth, God is praised and proclaimed. And we've been talking about company coming all the way through Christmas. And, um, and Todd did a great, great job preaching last week. Thank you. And, and, the, and he talked about listening and listening deeply and, and learning and seeing and sensing and connecting with a God who's communicating actively with you every moment to bring forth not only unity of all things under heaven and on earth under Christ, but he's working for you in your life so that you might experience a unity with him through your failures and your successes, through your struggles and your triumphs, When do, you, when do you pray most? I mean, honestly, seriously, when do you pray most? What do you pray for? Right? So mo most, I, I, I think, I didn't do a study of this, but I think most Christians, when, when, they, when they're feeling pressure, when they, when they see a need, or they, you, we pray for something, Right? And when we, when we end up in the fire, in, it, we, we pray that, that, it, it, that 
that God save us from it, that God rescue us from it. And, and when we're on the other side, the triumph side, we, pr- we pray thanksgiving. But I think the, the two ends get excluded the most. I think we, we pray in the middle. The most. So and it's, I get, well, I'm off track now. So let's just come back to center. I want you to pray. I want you to listen. And not just hear. If you were here last week, maybe you can go back and watch a sermon if you weren't. Not just hear. But I want you to listen deeply over the, the next week, the next couple of weeks, to what God is calling you to. And what God is calling us to as a church so that we're willing to take a risk so that we're willing to move forward so that we're willing to get up and try it again if God's calling us to that with more wisdom and more strength and more courage so that so that we don't have to, so that we don't have to to only trust God if he's right behind us so that we know that wherever God is, if he asks us to trust him, to, we can have the utmost assurance, the utmost courage. Because if he's calling us to it, we can't fail. How fast can you pull up a scripture, Todd? Todd? Romans 8.28. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. Or if you're on your phone, you can turn there. Paul wrote another letter. He wrote it to the church in Rome. And he wrote this. Romans 8.28. And we know That in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. His love never fails. Romans 8, 28 is one of my favorite chapters in the book. And it goes, Paul goes on to say, nothing, nothing can stop us. We are more than conquerors. He says, in all things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither life nor death, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Nothing. Take the risk. Listen to where God's calling you to. Any step forward is forward. But God might be calling you to run, to be a champion, 